Welcome back to biology. Be here. Have you ever needed to copy something by hand, like these complex math formulas? Copying can be tedious work, and if you make even a single mistake, it can throw everything off. Remember when we learned about the cell cycle a few lessons ago? We now know that cells have to make copies of themselves and divide so that you can grow and your body can replenish organs with new cells as old cells die. In an average human lifetime, approximately 10 quadrillion cell divisions will take place. Good thing you don't have to copy those math formulas that many times. Part of that process is DNA replication. After all, every new cell has to have the instructions it needs to function. Copying the DNA correctly for each and every one of those 10 quadrillion times may seem like an overwhelming task, but your body has it down to a science. It has to do with how DNA is structured. Remember that we learned in the last lesson that DNA is a double helix, made of pairs of nucleotide bases. A's always pair with T's, and G's always pair with C's. This provides a template for the DNA to be copied from. We'll look at the details as we go through the lesson. After today's lesson, you'll be able to explain how the structure of DNA allows it to become a template for replication, describe the role of enzymes in DNA replication, explain how telomeres relate to the aging process, and compare DNA replication in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Remember that DNA replication is one of the main events of interphase, specifically of S phase. In G2, the copied DNA will be checked for errors. If it doesn't pass, it won't be allowed to continue on to mitosis, because perfectly replicating the DNA is extremely important. Unfortunately, some errors may slip through sometimes, despite the cell's best efforts to stop them. We'll learn more about that in a later lesson. The process of DNA replication begins when a double strand unwinds and unzips. This separates the complementary base pairs. A's and T's get ripped apart, as do G's and C's. Each half of the DNA is now just a single strand. It seems a little cruel, like losing your best buddy. Don't worry though, new friends will be joining them soon. Now that each nucleotide base is separated, it will need to find a new complementary base to pair with. Where do these extra nucleotides come from? Nucleotides for DNA replication are synthesized in your liver, and they can also be salvaged from DNA and RNA that is broken down. These free nucleotides join up with their complementary base on the now exposed single strand of DNA to make a new double strand. See? new friends already found. Because both strands of the original DNA molecule get new base pairs, we end up with two DNA molecules, where there used to only be one. Each strand is half original and half new, so this process is considered to be semi-conservative. Think back a few units ago. Do you remember learning about enzymes? They are proteins that act as catalysts, meaning they help chemical reactions occur. DNA replication would not be able to proceed correctly without the help of many enzymes. We'll look at a few of the important ones. One of the first things that has to happen for DNA to replicate is unzipping, meaning the two strands of the double-stranded molecule have to break apart. The place where this happens is called the replication fork, because it causes a fork in the road. This leaves the A's, T's, G's, and C's unpaired. The helicase enzyme is responsible for cutting apart the two strands, breaking the hydrogen bonds between the paired nucleotides. 
the single strand that is left on each side of the fork will become the template that makes a new strand when free nucleotides join on. But before the DNA can be unzipped, it has to be unwound out of its supercoiled state. And this happens with the help of the topoisomerase enzyme. A third enzyme, DNA polymerase, has the very important job of attaching the new nucleotides to their complementary bases to make the pairs for the new double-stranded DNA. It's like a matchmaker helping the free nucleotides find their friends. This strand is also proofread as it is made, and cases of mismatched bases are fixed. In this case, a T has paired with another T instead of an A. The enzyme exonuclease cuts out the mistake here so that it can be replaced with the correct nucleotide. You may have noticed on some of these diagrams that the process works a little differently between the top and bottom strand. On the leading strand, pictured at the top here, the strand is made continuously as one connected piece. However, the lagging strand, pictured on the bottom, is made in smaller chunks, called Okazaki fragments. These fragments are glued together by the enzyme DNA ligase to make another continuous strand. Here is a list of the enzymes we've talked about and what they do. Take a minute to copy any of these into your notes that you missed. We have topoisomerase uncoiling the DNA, helicase splitting apart the double strand at the replication fork, DNA polymerase assembling the new strand from free nucleotides, exonuclease removing mismatched nucleotides, and DNA ligase gluing together the Okazaki fragments from the lagging strand. Remember that DNA exists in tightly coiled structures called chromosomes. At the end of each chromosome is a region of non-coding DNA called a telomere. It's not used to make proteins, and you can think of this region as some extra padding at the end of the chromosome. And it's good that we have the padding because each time the DNA is replicated, a little bit of that telomere is shortened until it is eventually lost altogether. This is the most likely culprit of the aging process. Once the telomeres from chromosomes have been lost, the cell can't undergo mitosis and divide. Eventually, the cells are forced to enter the senescent phase, where they do not divide anymore, but may secrete chemicals that damage healthy tissue around them and contribute to the overall process of aging. Humans, on average, lose about 25 base pairs off the end of each chromosome each year. However, some enzymes have shown promise in preventing telomeres from shortening, and this research may be the key to increasing life expectancy and slowing the aging process. The overall process of DNA replication is remarkably similar in all organisms, including bacteria. The double strand is separated, new nucleotides find their complementary nucleotide to pair with, and two new strands of DNA are formed. There are a few small differences in DNA replication for prokaryotes, however. In bacteria, or prokaryotic cells, the DNA is usually circular, instead of being linear like a eukaryotic chromosome. So there is a single point of replication, and it continues all the way around the circle. Instead of having multiple origins of replication, like a eukaryotic DNA strand, bacteria also copy their DNA faster and can replicate at a rate of around 2,000 base pairs a second. Eukaryotic cells, like humans, can only copy around 100 base pairs each second, which still seems like a lot. But both types of cells make use of their double helix structure and complementary base pair matching to be able to make templates for easy replicating. As we went through today's lesson, we 
explained how the structure of DNA allows it to become a template for replication, described the role of enzymes in DNA replication, explained how telomeres relate to the aging process, and compared DNA replication in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We've mentioned several times already that the main purpose of DNA is to make protein. But how does that process occur? How do we go from a strand of nucleotide base pairs to a fully folded and functioning protein? The process happens in two steps, and we'll look at the first one next time. Until then, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life! Hey, hey.